Imagine this, unless it's happened to you, then you don't have to imagine. But what would you do if you woke up one morning and found that when you went to check your bank statement, your bank account, you found that there was $1.2 million in your bank account? What would you do? That happened to Kathleen Spadoni. A couple years ago, Charles Schwab and company went to transfer $82.56 into her bank account, her mortgage brokerage account. But instead of transferring $82.56, they transferred $1,205,619.56. So whoever made that mistake, at least they can say, I got the 56 cents right. Uh, Spadoni, seeing that, quickly went out, transferred the funds to a different account, and quickly ran out and bought a house and a car. So eventually, uh, and she stopped communicating with Schwab as they tried to get the money back. So eventually she was charged with theft, bank, bank fraud, and illegal transmission of funds. But the spokesman for the sheriff's office said this, when you're expecting $80, and you get 1.2 million, there's probably something wrong. <laughs> I share that story because in Romans chapter 4, we're going to find a Greek word used 11 times, and it means to credit or to put into your account. The Greek word is logizomai, and it means to credit your account. And in Romans chapter 4, what we're going to see is God credits our account with his righteousness. His righteousness is credited into our account. And the beautiful thing about it is it's not a mistake. It's the gift of God. So let's pick up in Romans chapter 3, beginning in verse 27, and then let's pray. Paul writes this, Then what becomes of our boasting? It is excluded. By what kind of law? By a law of works? No, but by the law of faith. For we hold that one is justified by faith apart from works of the law. Or is God the God of Jews only? Is he not the God of Gentiles also? Yes, of Gentiles also, since God is one. He will justify the circumcised by faith and the uncircumcised through faith. Do we then overthrow the law by this faith? By no means. On the contrary, we uphold the law. Let's pray together. Lord, again, we just uh, thank you so much for giving us this book. This book and this message and the way that Paul just systematically lays out the good news of what you have accomplished for us through Jesus Christ. And we ask you, Lord, this morning, let our hearts be good ground for this. And let us receive this message, not just intellectually, but with our very souls. Let it not just be interesting to us, let it be food for us and drink for us, that we live on this, Lord. Because we do, we live on what Jesus has done. And we thank you for this time and being together in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. So I've entitled this message, What's Law Got to Do With It? And Paul wants his Jewish and his Gentile readers to understand how does the law and faith interact with each other in the gospel. What has the gospel done to the law? Has it abolished it? Has it caused it to be irrelevant? That's what Paul wants to answer. What's law got to do with it? And uh, Paul is just taught, if you remember, we looked at last week how God is both the just, is both just and the justifier of those who believe in Jesus Christ. He is both judge and attorney for the defense. God didn't save us by violating his justice. He saved us by upholding his justice in our place. At the cross, 
God didn't do away with his justice. He turned his justice on himself. And Jesus bore the price, the penalty, in order that God might be just. The cross is just. And the justifier of those who believe in Christ. That means to make them righteous. So Paul asks, what becomes of our boasting? If our salvation is an undeserved gift, what do we have to boast about? And the answer is nothing. Nothing. If we were saved by what we did, if we were saved by the law of the works, if we were saved by doing this and doing that and believing this and, and going here and, and not doing that, then we'd have something to boast about. We'd have law, the works, our good works. We'd have keeping the law, whatever the law is for us. We'd have that to boast about because the law of faith is simply trusting in what Jesus Christ has done for us. Our boasting of ourselves is silenced. Ain't going to be no boasting in ourselves when we stand before God. So if we're saved by faith apart from the law, where does that leave the law? Because for thousands of years, the law has been central to the Jewish identity. It has been the law, one of the, the pillars of who they are and what they believe in and their identity as God's chosen and that God gave them the law. And they every day centered their lives on the law and keeping the law and avoiding transgressing the law. And so what does this mean? And Paul can imagine them asking, does this mean the faith has done away with the law and made it irrelevant? So in verse 31, chapter 331, he says, he asks that question, do we then overthrow the law by this faith? By no means, he says. On the contrary, we uphold the law. The gospel doesn't undermine the law. It upholds it. It establishes it. Because the gospel is Jesus kept the law perfectly in our place. He didn't come to abolish the law. He came to fulfill it, to live it in our place. But if we are saved by faith in Christ apart from the law, what's law got to do with it? What does the law have to do with our lives? Where does it stand in our lives? Well, one of the things it means, and you've got to understand, for the Jewish listener back then, this would be a complete um, mind-boggling concept. It means that what the Jews for thousands of years thought was the purpose of the law wasn't the purpose of the law. The law wasn't given for the reason the Jews thought it was given. It wasn't given to make us righteous. It was given to point us to our need to have a righteousness given to us. And Paul says, I'm going to take you back to voices you will revere to show how what I'm telling you is not some new thing that we just made up, but it goes back to the very beginning of the Old Testament. And so he turns to Abraham, the father of the Jews, to prove this point. Let's read on Romans chapter 4, verses 1 through 5. He says this, What then shall we say was gained by Abraham, our forefather, according to the flesh? For if Abraham was justified by works, he has something to boast about. He's talking about what we have to boast about, but not before God. For what does the scripture say? Abraham believed God, and it was counted to him as righteousness. Now to the one who works, his wages are not counted as a gift, but as his due. And to the one who does not work, but believes in him who justifies the ungodly, his faith is counted as righteousness. Abraham is the father of the Jews, one of the most honored men in all of Jewish history. 
The question Paul asks is, did God consider Abraham a righteous man because of his works or because of his faith? And in Genesis chapter 15, God comes to Abraham after a, a victory in battle that Abraham won. And God comes to Abraham and he says, I will be your shield. I will be your protector. I will be your great reward. And Abraham pours out his heart to God and says, what good is a reward to me when I do not have an heir to pass it on to? More than anything, I want a son. I want someone to pass on my legacy to, and I have none, and I'm getting old, God. And God takes Abraham outside and into the night sky, and he says, look up and count the stars. If you can count the stars in the sky, you will be able to count the descendants I will give you. I will give you a son. And verse 3 says, Abraham believed God, and it was counted, logizmo, it was counted to him as righteousness. Abraham was counted as righteous. God filled his account with righteousness. Why? Paul asked, because he kept the law? No. It would be another 240 years before the law was even given through Moses. But maybe it's because Abraham was circumcised. No, it would be another 14 years before Abraham was circumcised. Which means, in the Jewish mentality, Abraham at this point in Genesis 15 is still a Gentile. God has counted him righteous when he was still an uncircumcised Gentile. But he put his faith, he trusted in the promise of God, and God filled his account. He woke up that morning with $1.2 million worth of righteousness, far more than that. And it wasn't a mistake, and it wasn't a clerical error. It was a gift from God. Abraham was justified. He was made righteous because he believed. Then Paul calls upon David, another great name in the Jewish lexicon, the greatest king apart from Jesus who has ever lived. And to confirm this truth, he quotes from Psalm 32, written by David right after he had committed adultery and murder and confessed it to God. And verse uh, chapter uh, Psalm 32, beginning in verse 6, says, um, actually, Romans chapter 4, verse 6 says, Just as David also speaks of the blessing of the one to whom God counts, Logizondomai, counts righteousness apart from works, blessed are those whose lawless deeds are forgiven and whose sins are covered. Blessed is the man against whom the Lord will not count his sin. Psalm 32, David's account is deep, deep, deep in debt. He had broken the law. He had sinned against God. He had committed adultery. He had murdered a man. His account was deep in debt. And so David writes, happy is the man. Blessed is the one whose lawless deeds are forgiven, whose sins will not be counted logizomai, against him or her. If you've ever had a massive debt hanging over your head, have you ever had that and you don't know how you're going to come out from under that massive debt? I know we went through that for a period of time where we had a massive debt and you know the drill. You know what happens. You end up paying your $80 a month, and the interest is $90 a month. And the hole gets deeper and deeper. 
and you don't know of a way to get out of it. That's the moral crisis David is in. He owes a million dollars. He can afford $80 a month. He is in debt beyond his ability to pay. And David says, how happy is the man who wakes up one morning and finds their debit account is, is erased. Their credit debt is erased. It's gone. How happy is that man? How does that happen? It happens through forgiveness. How blessed is the man who's forgiven. See, forgiveness is absorbing the wrong that someone does against us. Forgiveness is absorbing the hurt, the pain, the offense, the wound that has been committed against us. That's what forgiveness is. When we forgive someone, we're not saying, hey, you know, it was okay, it's a, you didn't hurt me. You, you know, it's not, forgiveness is not denying the pain, it's not denying the wrong, it's not denying those things. We're acknowledging the wrong. We're acknowledging the pain. And then forgiveness says, I will absorb that wrong. I will absorb that pain. I'm not requiring of it back from you. I am absorbing it. You are forgiven. That's what Jesus did for us on the cross. It's what he did. He absorbed our sin, our hurt, our pain, our wrong, wrong against God. He absorbed it on the cross. Our debt to God was absorbed so that we could be forgiven. Blessed is the one whose sins aren't counted, logizomai, against them. The account is emptied of all that debt, and to whom God counts righteousness apart from works. As a massive swing, it's like going from $1.2 million in debt to going to having $1.2 million in your bank account. It's a massive swing that has been accomplished through grace and through faith in Christ. And so Paul comes back to Abraham to point out the spiritual principle that Abraham was counted righteous before he was circumcised. This is super important. I know we don't think in terms of circumcision a whole lot today, but it was central to their identity. It was one of those central governing points to the Jewish identity. And so here's the question. If, if Abraham had been counted righteous after being circumcised, then the Jews could rightfully say, you need to be circumcised in order to be righteous. Just like Abraham. But God counted Abraham righteous before he was circumcised, before they had the law, before Abraham was even a Jew. And that means... He's not only the father of the Jews, he's the father of the Gentiles who, like him, believe the promises of God. And that's what he says, beginning in verse 9. Is this blessing then only for the, only for the circumcised or also for the uncircumcised? For we say that faith was counted to Abraham as righteousness. How then was it counted to him? Was it before or after he had been circumcised? It was not after, but before he was circumcised. He received the sign of circumcision as a seal of the righteousness that he had by faith while he was still uncircumcised. The purpose was to make him the father of all who believe without being circumcised so that righteousness would be counted to them as well, and to make him the father of the circumcised, who are not merely circumcised, but who also walk in the footsteps of the faith that our father Abraham had before he was circumcised. So Paul does this mental jujitsu that Abraham isn't just the father of the Jews. He's not just the father of the circumcised. He's also the father of the uncircumcised who believe in him. And then, here's where the jujitsu flips in here. He says, and he is also the father of the circumcised 
who believe in God's promises the way Abraham did. So what we're going to begin to see is Paul is going to be center. It's not the circumcision that's important. It's the faith. You could be circumcised as a Jew, but you're not a child of Abraham if your heart doesn't believe the promises. That's the identifying power in Abraham, not the physical sign of circumcision. Circumcision didn't make Abraham righteous. It was given as a sign and a seal, Paul writes, a sign that showed he had believed God's promises, that he belonged to God, and a seal that reminded Abraham that God will fulfill his promises, that he would keep it. As Christians, we are given the Holy Spirit as a sign and a seal, as a sign that we have the Holy Spirit within us, it's a sign that we have believed in Christ and we belong to Him. Isn't that beautiful? Isn't that wonderful? Whenever you feel discouraged about yourself, but you say, but I see the Holy Spirit working in my life, it's a sign you belong to Him. You belong to God. You have believed in Christ. And it's also a seal, a down payment, a, a this, is, this transaction is done, that we will be safely delivered into the kingdom of heaven by the promises of God through Christ. So we get this down payment that says, you ain't going nowhere, and there is no insecurity in you because you belong to me, and you will dwell with me, and I right now dwell in you. Sign and a seal. So I want to just kind of close by sharing kind of what I think is the big take-home of this. We either, and by the way, this is true for Christians too. Christians can love Jesus, but also have legalism in them. Amen? I don't believe a Christian can be 100% legalistic because that would not be Christianity. But we all have a legalistic bent in us. I, I know I do. We all do. And so we either relate to God on the basis of works or on the basis of faith, on the basis of wages or the basis of gift. See, Romans 4, 4 says, Now to the one who works, his wages are not counted as a gift, but as his due. If you get paid, let me ask you this question. You know, many of you get paid, right? How many of you, your boss says on Friday or whenever, I've, I'm giving you a gift again this week. I'm giving you a gift. What do you mean you're giving me a gift? I worked all week. I, I, I'm giving you a gift. How generous of me. No, it's your wages. You earned it. You worked your hours. You got your wage. It's not a gift. It's not Christmas when he gives you that. Don't look at your bank account and say, oh my goodness, he gave it again. I can't believe it. I don't see the connection between working and getting paid. It's a wage. But Romans 3, 23 and 24 says, For all have sinned and fall short of the glory of God and are justified by his grace as a gift. That's a gift. So if we relate on to God on the basis of our works, that is keeping the Mosaic law or your church rules and regulations or some kind of moralistic code, and I'm not saying that moralistic codes are wrong, but if that's how you relate to God, he loves me today because I did this and I do that and I don't do that. And I don't think he loves those people because they do that and they don't do this. If we relate to God on that basis, one of two things is going to happen. We're either going to change the law or we're going to be crushed by the law. We're either going to change the law or we're going to be crushed by the law. If you're trying to keep the law and make it into heaven and make God accept you and be good enough for him, you're, if, you, if you think you're keeping you're changing the law. You're changing the law from something that you cannot do to something you can do do. You can keep. I had a memory. I've shared this before, but my dad had studied the martial arts. And um, one day, I was about 11 years old, I came across a little book on how to do karate. And when you're 11 years old, 12 years old, you want to, you want to be a tough guy, you know. And I just love the idea of, you know, having to register my hands as lethal weapons. So I got this book out, and it had pictures and instructions, how to chop, how to kick, how to flip, how to do all these things, and all these, you know, in, in pictures, how to do it. 
the problem was I didn't have anybody, any sparring partner or anything, so I grabbed a, uh, a throw pillow. And I began to chop that pillow, kick that pillow. I'd flip that pillow. And uh, I got pretty good. I got pretty good. If I was ever attacked by a throw pillow in a dark alley, I'd do OK. Here's the thing, lowering the standard. You know, how many, you know, if you actually, if I was actually put in an MMA cage, how long am I going to last? See, I lowered the standard, and I really did. I, you know, my 11-year-old brain, I thought I was accomplishing something. I thought I was getting tough. But I was lowering the standard to a ridiculous level and thought I was doing well. That's what we will do to the law if we think we're keeping it. If you think you're good, if you think you're doing good because of what you do and what you don't do and all this, and you think, boy, I'm better than people because I pray more and I read the Bible more and I go to church more and I, I'm this and I'm that and I'm the next thing, and you, you've changed the law. You have changed the law. You're throwing throw pillows. You're kicking throw pillows. You're chopping throw pillows. And you've changed the law from the stuff that we can't do, like love your neighbor as yourself. Love God with all your heart, mind, soul, and strength. Do not covet. Do not even look upon a person to lust after them. Do not be angry, for when you're angry, you murdered them in your heart. And see, all that stuff that gets to the heart, we've changed all that to stuff we can keep. Don't drink alcohol. Don't go to the movies. Wear a certain pair, type of clothes. Listen or don't listen to a certain kind of music. Don't smoke cigarettes. Go to church. Read the Bible. Give to the poor. We can do all those things. And I'm not saying those things are wrong at all. Some of them are very helpful. But they are not, they're just throw pillows if we think we're making it in God's eyes and his acceptance and merit by keeping those things. We've lowered God's standard from $1.2 million to $80.56. If we don't change the law, we will be crushed by it. And maybe there's some here, you, you feel the weight even though you hear the gospel, you feel the weight of feeling condemned. Constant inner voices saying, I'm not good enough. I'm not doing enough. I'm not measuring up. And that's exhausting. That's exhausting. And into that exhaustion, Jesus speaks and he says, Come to me. You who are heavy laden and weary, and I will give you rest. Take my yoke upon you and learn from me. The Lord's yoke is grace. It's the gift of righteousness. It is the, his yoke is a yoke of forgiveness. It's a yoke of acceptance. It's a yoke of mercy. It's a yoke of freedom. It's a yoke of love. It's a yoke of humility. And with his yoke, as we take his yoke, guess what happens when two animals get yoked together? They pull together. When we get yoked with Jesus, we pull together with him. He does all the work. His grace enables us to honor and uphold the law. Not dismiss it. Not lower it, not be crushed by it. I want to close with a quote again from Tim Keller about that very truth. Only the gospel allows us to recognize and uphold the perfect standards of the law because we know that the law matters enough to God for it to bring death. But we also know that it no longer means our death. We don't need to ignore the law we cannot keep or be crushed by the law we cannot keep. We are free to have a right respect 
for moral absolutes and to care deeply about justice. We can be secure in ourselves, non-judgmental of others, forgiving to those who wrong us, and not crushed by our own flaws and failings. The gospel frees us to uphold the law. Thank you, Lord, for freeing us not to live life however we want, not to live life in licentiousness uh, and sin, but to actually live life by grace where we have power and the desire within our hearts by your grace to obey you. But we don't receive all that by what we do, but what, what you have given us freely through your great mercy and grace. Lord, I pray if anybody here is living in a legalistic treadmill where they are either changing the law and thinking they're keeping it when they're not, or they're crushed by it with condemnation, I pray you set them free. Set them free to open their hands and freely receive that forgiveness that Jesus offers us and that righteousness that you offer us through faith in Christ the righteousness of God. We receive it freely. Blessed is the man or woman whose sins are not counted against them. In Jesus' name, amen. <laughs>